have regarded Seller's appeals to non-conceptual sensory representations as part of a wider package of retrograde scientistic views from which Seller's more enduring insights about the famous the myth of the given and the logical space of reasons can and ought to be saved. And I'll say some more about what those are. In particular, John McDowell's account of sensory experience, which he builds upon a new treatment in this 2009 book, Having the World in View, um, has taken a subtle new turn. Um, in particular, his treatment of Sellers has changed along with his, his own view having changed. So in this paper, I want to focus on McDowell's revised understanding of the content of perceptual experience in terms of what he, he now understands to be intuitions or Kantian intuitions um, or the intuitional content of experience. As on McDowell's previous view in Mind and World, which I assume most of you are familiar with, such Kantian intuitions are still understood to have a content that is entirely conceptual in nature. But on the new view, intuitional content, uh, while conceptual, is non-propositional in form. And what I want to explore here is the nature of this new distinction and consider some questions, it seems to me, to raise. And I want to consider how that view stands in relation to some views of, of sellers. So it'll be helpful to begin with a reminder of, of one central line <coughs> of thought in McDowell's mind and world. McDowell is now routinely cited as one of the main proponents of the outlook in the philosophy of perception that's come to be known as conceptualism. McDowell's own aim in mind and world and subsequent works was not to generate a new ism, but to argue that certain philosophical options that have seemed to be compulsory in the light of modern science, and which McDowell thinks have rendered deeply problematic the general question of how our conceptual capacities can be rationally informed by sensory input from the world um, are not, in fact, compulsory philosophical options. And that's one of McDowell's main aims. So one of his main contentions in mind and world, and this carries over to the new view, is that the very possibility of sense experiences having any justificatory bearing on our rational thinking requires the recognition that our conceptual capacities are, in some sense, already operative in, in structuring the very sensory content that we receive from objects in sense perception. Now, in the sense that derives from McDowell's work, then conceptualism is roughly, I mean, these terms are under, high, you know, I'm learning about the manifold distinctions in the literature between conceptualists and non-conceptualists, but roughly speaking, in the case of rational human perceptual experience, whatever may be the case with non-rational animals, conceptualism is the thesis that the sensory content we receive in being affected by objects must itself be content that is through and through conceptually structured and conceptually informed. So that's conceptualism. And in, in that sense, although he, he doesn't like to purvey new isms, McDowell is cited accurately as a, as a as a conceptualist. I think Strawson used to use the phrase that experience is thoroughly saturated with PF, the old Strawson, PF Strawson. Um, experience is thoroughly saturated with conceptual content. And I think this is a very interesting and important issue. McDowell makes prominent use of Seller's famous myth of the given as a central source of support for this conceptualist outlook. For a primary interest of the, the so-called myth of the given was supposed to be the idea that sensations or sensory appearances regarded as merely non-conceptual states or occurrences, just a sensing or having of a sensation. The myth is the idea that such a sensation might somehow be able to stand in justificatory relations to our perceptual beliefs and judgments. But as Sellers remarks in rejecting the myth of the given, quote, Sensations are no more epistemic in character than are trees or tables. That's just a statement of his conclu conclusion. A sensation is just a happening. It's not, it's not of the right shape to stand in justificatory relations. The idea that the given with a capital G in this sense is a myth is currently a hotly di disputed topic, but for present purposes, it's common ground. It's agreed between McDowell and Sellers to reject this idea of the myth of the given. The conceptualist, like McDowell, accordingly concludes that 
sensory content must in some sense be conceptually structured content. If our sensory receptions from objects are to play the fundamental epistemic role that we think they do play in guiding our rational adjustments to reality, empirical reality. So it's for these reasons that Sellers and McDowell have free, you know, they've recently been cited as the two founding fathers of conceptualism in the philosophy of perception. Now, this is just one example, um, and it's an understandable thing. It's in quote one. Fall, this is from a, a rec recent um, 2003 issue devoted to the structure of non-conceptual content. The editors write, following, it's quote number one on the handout, following Sellers and McDowell, the founding fathers of conceptualism, most, con most of the conceptualists remain far from psychology and from the <coughs> idiom of empirical studies. Now, the characterization of Sellers as opposed to McDowell as a founding father of conceptualism is, it turns out to be, to be a mistake, although it's a very widespread one and it's, actual un it, it's an understandable one, as I'll show in a moment. If anything, really, the opposite is true. From what I gather from current debates about the nature of conceptual perceptual content, Sellers, as opposed to McDowell, should be classified as rejecting conceptualism and defending a prominent role for non-conceptual representational content in perceptual experience. He's a non-conceptualist. To take just one among, there's another example. Robert Hanna writes, I think, very useful and good stuff on Kant. Um, he's got recent articles called Kant, Kantian Non-Conceptualism, and the idea is that Kant had concepts and he had sensible intuitions. And Robert Hanna is saying, look, that sensibility is a, a form of non-conceptual content. But he sets up McDowell and Sellers and Sellers as his opponents, his conceptualist opponents, and he sums up in the following quote number two, quote, the Salarsian space of reasons is nothing more and nothing less than a discursive, that is, conceptual, judgment-driven, and linguistic, and a priori normative superstructure built upon the platform of essentially non-conceptual embodied animal experience. Uh, and that involves non-conceptual representation, I think. While this was intended as a kind of concluding non-conceptualist swipe at, at Sellers and McDowell, um, Sellers is actually, that fits Sellers' view pretty well, that quote. So what's the reason for this historical anomaly? Um, well, it, it, I think it's pretty easy to see. Quote three is the famous space of reasons passage from Sellers' Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, 1956. Quote, the essential point is that in characterizing an episode, an event, or a state as that of knowing, we're not giving an empirical description of that episode or state. We're placing it in the logical space of reasons of justifying and being able to justify what one says, unquote. So knowledge on this Salarsian view, which is shared in one way or another by Rorty McDowell, Brandom, and Sellers, all of them, um, is a certain normative status within a logical space of giving and asking for justifying reasons. And not just knowledge, as, as McDowell emphasized very nicely in mind and world, not just knowledge but meaning and intentionality more generally, correctness with regard to applying concepts at all to the world, turn out on Sellers' view to be essentially norm-governed matters within a conceptually articulate space of propositional reason giving. Um, so what we might call crudely the Salarsian space of reasons thesis is, is intended to rule out the idea that any non-conceptually structured item, considered merely as such, for instance, a sense datum or a sensation, could be sufficient to confer any epistemic warrant on any claim as to how things stand in the world. Put loosely, for the world to have any justificatory bearing on our claims and for our thoughts to have any intentional content that is answerable to how things are in the empirical world, requires that all those epistemic and intentional phenomena be conceptually articulable by their very nature. In this sense, at the risk of uh, some simplification, we might characterize the general space of reasons thesis that is shared by all these Salarsians as a kind of epistemic conceptualism, um, where that includes intentionality. And these are all normative conceptual phenomena, understood in a broad sense that includes intentionality. 
But conceptualism as a thesis concerning the nature and content of perceptual experience is a different matter. What for convenience I'll call, although I know the literature has distinctions on this sort of thing, but I'll call it experiential content conceptualism as opposed to epistemic conceptualism. Experiential content conceptualism is the further thesis that all the representational content in human sensory experience of objects, at least at the level of rational human cognition, must be conceptual content. All representational content is conceptual content. That's experiential content con conceptualism. A typical non-conceptualist, by contrast, points, for example, to the richness and the fineness of grain of a visually presented scene and argues that there is content represented in the visual experience that is not conceptualized by the experiencer and that sensory representational content of this kind characterizes the experiences of both rational and non-rational animals. Uh, there's a lot that has to be precisely stated in those, th in those th but let's let that do. In these broad terms, then, I think the reason for this confusion in the literature about Sellers and McDowell can be put as follows. McDowell argues that the epistemic conceptualism embodied in Sellers' Space of Reasons thesis entails experiential content conceptualism. All the representational content of human perceptual experience must be conceptual content. Sellers, by contrast, held that the thoroughgoing epistemic conceptualism entailed by his Space of Reasons thesis is consist consistent with the hypothesis, which he also defends, that human sensory experience crucially includes non-conceptual representational content. In these rough, rough terms, Sellers is an epistemic conceptualist and an intentional content, intentional with a T, content conceptualist, but he's not an experiential content conceptualist in the sense relevant to current debates about non-conceptual content. He's a defender of since the 50s, he was a defender of non-conceptual sensory representational content. So while the literature <coughs> thus tends to mistakenly class Sellers with McDowell as an experiential content conceptualist, uh, some, I mean, Paul doesn't do this, and, and people in the know don't do this, and McDowell is, is fully aware of what's going on and is a good reader of Sellers, McDowell himself. Um, I think McDowell's own writings have be become increasingly more accurate about the role of non-conceptual sensory content in Sellers' philosophy. I think the Woodbridge lectures improved upon his characterization of Sellers in Mind and World, and the more recent stuff, having the book on the collection of articles, the crucial article, Avoiding the Myth of the Given, 2008, I think it is, um, improves upon the Wood Woodbridge lectures, and, Sellers, and McDowell says this himself. So that's why I'm interested in this stuff. McDowell still holds the thesis that the space of reasons thesis should rule out non-conceptual content in the relevant sense. But his take on Seller's opposing view has helped to shape McDowell's own new position, his new revised position. And that's what I want to turn to is, is McDowell's position. Uh, so section two. In, in his 2008 article, Avoiding the Myth of the Given, McDowell sums up the conception of the capital G given that he's concerned to avoid as follows, quote number five. The myth is the idea that sensibility by itself could make things available for the sort of cognition that draws on the subject's rational powers, which is a nice statement of one version of the myth. As we've seen, McDowell's view is that avoiding the myth of the given requires that conceptual capacities belonging to reason are in some sense already operative in our sensory experiences themselves and not just in the judgments or beliefs to which those experiences give rise. It's in relation to the manner in which such conceptual capacities are involved in sensibility that McDowell, McDowell now wants to abandon two of his previous assumptions. So this is uh, quote number six. I used to assume, says McDowell, that to conceive experiences as actualizations of conceptual capacities, we would need to credit the experiences with propositional content, the sort of content judgments have. Secondly, I used to assume that the content of, a, of an experience would need to include everything the experience enables its subject to know non-inferentially. 
But both these assumptions now strike me as wrong. The second one's a bit tricky. McDowell will abandon the first assumption that experiences have propositional content in favor of his new conception of experiences as non-propositional yet conceptually structured sensory intuitions of objects. It turns out that these sensory intuitions are to be restricted to what Aristotle called the proper and common sensible properties of objects. In the case of vision, which I'll restrict myself to, colors are the proper sensibles and shape, size, and motion, and so on, are the, are the common sensibles, uh, common to sight and touch, for instance. I'll tend to refer to just color and shape, and I'll tend to refer to them both as the proper sensibles. But the color is what's properly sen sensorily taken in by vision, and color and, sh and shape is, its, is, is the common sensible to touch and, and, and sight. Intuitions on the view McDowell arrives at are conceptualized but non-propositional sensory awarenesses of the proper sensible qualities of objects. So he's restricting the content in that way, and, and there's interesting things in Sellers that we'll see where he does the same thing, a similar thing. So before um, talking about that first, uh, abandoning the first assumption that experience has to be propositional, McDowell explains the second, his abandonment of his second assumption. Um, and he motivates his change in view, which he tells us was stimulated by Charles Travis, by using an ordinary example to illustrate the abandonment of the assumption that everything in experience enables us to know non-inferentially must be included in the content of the experience itself, which is what McDowell previously assumed. We'll get some examples for this now. So McDowell supposes that he looks at a bird and immediately sees non-inferentially that it's a cardinal without inference. On his previous view in Mind and World, for instance, a proposition one might express by saying, There's a, that's a cardinal, must be part of the content of the experience. He confronts a bird, he immediately, non-inferentially recognizes it to be a cardinal, so the proposition that's a cardinal must be part of the experience itself. Now, however, McDowell says the following, following quote seven, but what seems right is this, my experience makes the bird visually present to me and my recognitional capacity enables me to know non-inferentially that what I see is a cardinal." Unquote. He supports this by considering the case of someone who sees the same bird but can't immediately recognize, can't recognize cardinals non-inferentially. Quote number eight, her experience might be just like mine in how it makes the bird visually present to her. It is true that in an obvious sense things look different to me and to her, to me, what I see looks like, looks to be, a cardinal, and to her it does not. But that is just to say that my experience inclines me, and her similar experience does not incline her to say that it's, it is a cardinal. There's no ground here for insisting that the concept of a cardinal must figure in the content of my experience itself. And I'll probably come back, I think, to that the idea that the presence of the object causes an inclination to say or to think or to perceptually recognize that P. Um, so we'll come back to that. But the idea is that two people can see a bird, uh, just be acquainted with a bird in their environment, and then one of them has the recognitional capacity to non-inferentially see that it's a cardinal and the other doesn't. So it looks wrong to say that there's a cardinal is in the experience itself, because the experience just makes the bird available. And that's what McDowell thinks, I guess, Travis has convinced McDowell needs to be said in some sense. Now, McDowell does indicate that, on his view, experience does reveal to him that it's a cardinal. But in the sense that the experience of the bird puts him, puts him as someone who has acquired the, rec the right recognitional capacity in a position to know non-inferentially that the bird, which is the object he experiences, is a cardinal. So he, reckon, he, he grants that the bird reveals, that the experience reveals to him a cardinal, but it's, it's the experience, which will be what he calls the intuition, just makes the object present to him, and then further recognitional capacities are what make him know that it's a cardinal, non inferential. So the concept, conceptual content cardinal, owing to his recognitional capacity, should not be assumed, as he had previously, 
to be part of the content of the experience itself. That's his change in view. Now looking at, at quote nine, having rejected the second assumption, McDowell asks, quote, should we conclude that conceptual capacities are not operative in having objects visually present to one, but only in what one makes of what one anyway sees, unquote? Now, if I'm not mistaken, that's basically the, the Travis point that, that Travis had argued in his anti-representationalist article, a kind of Austinian article, The Silence of the Senses. Um, I'll say more about Travis in a moment. Travis just says it's the object as a non-conceptual item that our senses reveal to us. And then there are all kinds of things we make of it propositionally, differing depending on the occasion, or occasion sensitivity, he calls it. Now, what one anyway sees, as McDowell puts it here, is for Travis something non-conceptual, namely the object itself, which one then makes different things of depending on the occasion uh, in Travis's view. And McDowell has no problem with occasion sensitivity itself, that we make different things of objects on different occasions. Travis, however, had argued against McDowell's idea that experiences or appearances or looks as such have a face value propositional com content, the mind and world view, which judgment could then af affirm or reject. So if what proposition you're going to take things to have depends on the occasion and isn't something that's just, well, let's hear Travis gives a quite specific sentence now saying this, quote 10. Travis says, quote, all that demonstrable looks fix as to how things look fixes no particular way things should be to be the way that they look full stop. I think that's like a, a point from Austin as well. I think. There's no, there is no comma in that sentence. That was correctly transcribed. It's all that demonstrable looks fix as to how things look fixes no particular way things should be to be the way they, the way they look. Full stop. Thank God for the full what stop. Fodor calls his copulating snake style of writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has a certain elegance once you get used to it. You get something. <coughs> okay. Now, McDowell's new view accepts that experiences present objects non-propositionally. That's the adjustment he's making. And in a way that allows for different occasion-sensitive propositional recognitions or making, makings of what one sees anyway. But McDowell wants to reject Travis's idea that the senses bring objects into view in a way that does not draw on conceptual capacities. For as we saw above, that was just the myth of the given myth the given in, in the earlier quotation, um, quote five, was just the myth is the idea that sensibility by itself could, think, m could make things available for cognition, the sort of cognition that draws on the subject's rational powers. So McDowell says Travis's view is an instance of the myth of the given, so he doesn't want to go that way. What McDowell wants then is a conception of intuitional experience as the direct presentation of objects that is more basic than any articulate propositional recognition of what we see in, in, in a, some sense of basic, and is in that sense just given in the sensory experience, with a small g, but is not capital G given in the non-conceptual way that he argues necessarily falls afoul of the myth of the given. In support of this view of conceptualized intuitions, McDowell cites a famous passage from Kant's critique, quote, 11, the same function, this is from Kant, the same function which gives unity to the various representations in a judgment or proposition also gives unity to the mere synthesis of various representations in an intuition, a sensory intuition. And this unity, in its most general expression, we entitle the pure concept of the understanding. Now this stuff for, this is one of the things I, I like about McDowell, others might not, I, I mean, it's essays on Kant. Hegel and, and, and Sellers, and I think there's some support in Kant for what McDowell's trying to do with intuitions. What's interesting is that Sellers did, in a way, the same thing, um, and we'll see that in a minute. The general idea McDowell wants to adapt from Kant is that, um, it's continuing, quote, forms of intuitional unity correspond to forms of propositional unity. It's the capacity for judgment that is ultimately responsible for both forms of unity. This is not a quote now. But a sensory intuition has, quote, categorial unity 
unquote, in its conceptual contents in a non-propositionally articulated <coughs> form. Quote, discursive content is articulated, says McDowell, intuitional content is not. So we're just presented with an object, and, and call being presented with an object sensory intuition. And the idea that he takes from Kant's same function passage is that Kant holds that the same function, it's really judging, that accounts for the unity of propositions also accounts for the unity of the mere presentation of an object in intuition. Even though the way an object is presented in intuition isn't propositional, it's, conceptual in a, it's conceptually unified in a way that it wouldn't be if you weren't a judging being. That's the, that's the thesis. And it's going to enable McDowell to get between the horns of certain dilemmas. So what sort of unarticulated conceptual contents do intuitions have on this view? We saw McDowell exclude the, rep the recognitional content cardinal from the content of the visual experience of the bird. But as he very briefly notes in passing, the same argument will apply mutatis mutandis to seeing something as a bird as opposed to merely having that object in view without recognizing or being able to recognize birds. Someone sees an aviform or aviform, aviform, a bird-shaped red object in its environment. Hence the move to the traditional proper sensibles, the proper and common sensible qualities. Quote 12, quote, a natural stopping point for visual experiences would be proper sensibles of sight and common sensibles accessible to sight. We should conceive experience as drawing on conceptual capacities associated with concepts of the proper and common sensibles. Concepts of, like, concept of red, concept of shape, concept of square, and so on. As McDowell remarks, quote, Sellers gives a helpful illustration. The propositional unity in a judgment expressible by this is a cube corresponds to an intuitional unity expressible by this cube. So the, uh, well, that's from Seller's Science and Metaphysics, 1968. And McDowell thinks there's something right about Seller's move there. Suppose then that Smith has the sensory intuition of a certain red cube in plain view. We can say that whatever else Smith might immediately recognize that red cube to be, Perhaps he sees or makes out that it's a playing piece in a certain game. His basic sensory intuition of it as a red cubical object already requires that certain conceptual capacities have been operative even in that minimal sensory consciousness. These contents, the conceptual contents, include not only the concepts of the proper sensibles red and cube themselves, but also what McDowell following Kant calls quote, the pure concept of an object in general, that's Kant. These are, quote, formal concepts, McDowell's term, that specify, specify forms of, quote, categorial unity for objects. What kinds of categorial unity? Well, on this, McDowell remarks <laughs> that we need not follow Kant's attempt to specify 12 logical functions of judgment or forms of propositional unity, to use McDowell's phrase yielding 12 forms of categorical and intuitional unity. We don't need to follow any more than, you know, Strawson in the Bounds of Sense says, says similar things, that there's something right about what Kant's doing, but we don't need to think that we can isolate forms of intuitional unity and I, uh, for all 12 of these supposed logical structures. But the general idea is right, McDowell thinks. And some of you may know about, I don't know, although I, I hope to acquaint myself with it now, Michael Thompson's interesting view that McDowell cites about um, the conceptual representation of life or of living things is a kind of logically basic form of representation. So the, the movement of an animal, uh, possibly McDowell suggests, should be classified with, si with shape and color as something basic, uh, as basic as the proper and common sensible. So you just take in that something's perching or an animal's flying in the way you take it. Maybe that's as basic as size and shape, too. Um, but he doesn't commit to that, McDowell, but he thinks it's an interesting proposal. To do it, you have to argue, like apparently Thompson does, that there's a certain logical structure to the propositional stories about life that is unique and that has a certain kind of form that then structures our perceptions of objects having a unity of that kind. 
And there might be something to that. I think that animals might be built to take in other to to to, to see to, to have sensory basic sensory cognitions of an, other animals moving as basic as colored and shaped items. Now, whatever about that, an important intended, con I'm not going to, I'm just going to stick with color and shape. An important intended consequence of this new view, I think, is that the unarticulated, yet nonetheless conceptual nature of intuitional content gives McDowell a more robust way of attempting to accommodate the various richly detailed and fine-grained aspects of sensory experience that are usually appeared to by not appealed to by non-conceptualists. In intuitions, objects are given for us to know, McDowell says, in such a way that, quote, quote number 13, there are typically aspects of the content of an intuition that the subject has no means of making discursively explicit, unquote. To take a familiar consideration from the literature on non-conceptual -con content, objects in view will typically present a, mo a more rich variety of shades of color and other visible characteristics than one has names for, uh, McDowell still holds to his conceptualist view in mind and world that one can always make up, uh, make such aspects of experience discursively explicit by coining an adjective or a demonstrative phrase on the spot, such as um, having that shade of color. He still holds that view, but he now suggests that whether or not one already has the, the demonstrative concept, um, the articulate concept, um, he suggests that whether or not one already has that or needs to acquire it on the spot, such an explicitly discursive content, in either case, on his new view, there's now a basic difference between the visual presence of the sensible properties of objects in an intuition and the discursively articulate recognition of objects as having those properties. Um, quote 14, Dial quote, the unity of intuitional content is given not as a result of our putting significances together in a proposition. Even if discursive exploitation of some content given in an intuition does not require one to acquire a new discursive capacity, one already has the concept for that shade, one still needs to carve out that content from the intuition's unarticulated content before one can put it together with other bits of content in discursive activity. Intuiting does not do this carving out for one. Unquote. Now, so in a certain sense, McDowell can accommodate some of the, he doesn't put it this way, but it, it would enable him to accommodate many of the phenomena appealed to by non-conceptuals that look that the scene is just given with all its rich variety. Well, and it's not propositionally articulated. Well, McDowell now agrees it's given in an intuition. And that's not propositional or perceptual articulation or recognition, but it's still conceptual. On the other side of the coin, the coin, the dependence of this unarticulated intuitional content on judgmental capacities is supposed to preserve McDowell's basic conceptualist thesis that all sensory content is conceptual content. And also in doing so to preserve the idea that sensory experiences as such can be what entitle us to various corresponding recognitional claims and judgments bringing the small g givenness of experience safely within the space of reasons and avoiding the myth of the, of the capital G given. Okay, so section three, I want to just look at that a, a bit. I think this new account raises some at least puzzling questions from the perspective of McDowell's own overall outlook as I, as I understand it. I'll consider just one question here and that's uh, really just one of the main points I want to reflect on, concerning what the resulting picture is supposed to be of how sensory experiences, quote, entitle us to beliefs, unquote, which after all remains one of the main points of the whole enterprise in the new view, just as it was in mind and world. Here's how McDowell now casts the question of entitlement, quote, 15. If an object is present to one through the presence to one of some of its properties, in an intuition in which concepts of those properties exemplify a unity that constitutes the content of a formal concept of an object, this is all how he's characterized an intuition, 
one is thereby entitled to judge propositionally that one is confronted by an object with those properties. The entitlement derives from the presence to one of the object itself, not from a premise uh, for an inference. Um, I think this sentence is supposed to read, the entitlement derives from the presence to one of the object itself, not from a premise for inference. Um, the presence of the object itself at one's disposal by being the content of one's experience. Or as he also puts it, quote, so I agree with Travis that visual experiences just bring our surroundings into view, thereby entitling us to take certain things to be so, but leaving it a further question what, if anything, we do take to be so, unquote. But bearing in mind that intuitional content is restricted to the proper and common sensible qualities on this new view, which belong to unified objects or something to that effect, are the certain things that he's just referred to, thereby entitling us to certain things, taking certain things to be so, are the certain things we're entitled to take to be so on the basis of intuitional experience going to include such things as seeing a cardinal? And the answer to this is supposed to be yes. But what the experience as intuition makes present to me is something like red, aviform, shaped, physical object. One can perhaps see in the case of corresponding propositional takings that concern the same basic sensible qualities of color and shape, how the new non-propositional kind of experience might retain the sort of direct experiential openness to the world that McDowell wants to maintain. But internal to McDowell's own concerns, I'm not sure what to make of the new interface that seems to open up. I don't think he'd want it to be a new interface, but that seems to open up between perceptual recognitions concerning and warranted by the proper sensibles present in an intuition on the one hand, so recognizing something to be a red cube, and all the other sorts of ordinary perceptual recognitions that go beyond that highly restricted sensory basis as when we recognize the presence of a cardinal or see something to be a cardinal. We can approach this issue in another way. McDowell also wants his new view to enable him to respond to Davidson's nothing is missing from my view response to McDowell's original criticism of Davidson in mind and world. Uh, so McDowell had criticized the Davidson view that objects just cause us to have these, these propositional responses. Um, but the propositional, only a belief can justify another belief, and so you're spinning within a, a, a coherence framework in which only beliefs us to justify other beliefs, and the object merely causes you to have that. But uh, Davidson and Davidsonians responded, look, what's missing? It's experience is propositional. The object causes us to have experience. So, um, so, quote 16, McDowell says, Davidson argued that if by experience we mean something with propositional content, it can only be a case of taking things to be so, distinctive in being caused by the impact of the environment on our sensory apparatus. It's propositional when it's caused by impacts on the environment, unquote. McDowell now says that on his earlier view, according to which experiences have propositional content, quote, Davidson's point seems well taken. If experiences have propositional content, it is hard to deny that experiencing is taking things to be so, unquote, which I think would land us back, he thinks, with the frictionless coherence versus myth of the given dilemma. Uh, either you appeal to just the blunt givenness of the object causing the propositions, or you appeal to relations among the propositions, and you're stuck in the, in the coherence. We avoid the Davidson horn of this dilemma because now his new view uh, this is the next, oh, it's part of quote 16. Quote, the conceptual content that allows us to avoid the myth is intuitional on the new view, not propositional. So experience is not taking things to be so. In bringing our surroundings into view, experiences entitle us to take things to be so. Whether we do is take things to be so is a further question, unquote. Now my worry is, what I wonder is, is whether, um, my worry is that with McDowell's new separation of conceptually minimal experiencing of proper sensibles, proper and common sensibles from ordinary perceptual recognition or taking things to be so, the original Davidsonian horn of the dilemma, that is McDowell's original objection, uh, 
that objects merely cause takings to be so is not enough, has simply been relocated rather than overcome. The new stable common ground of intuitions, I mean, Sellers rec emphasizes that the concepts of the proper and common sensibles, in a sense, don't change. What we see objects as changes, but Sellers thinks the manifest image, will all, we're always going to see things as colored-shaped objects. The proper and common sensibles don't change. Our conceptions of the causal nature, well, I'll get, get to that. The new stable common ground of intuitions of various shaped and colored objects gives rise to all the variety of propositional perceptual seeings that such and such is the case that outstrip the limited conceptual contents of the intuitional experience itself. The supposed virtues of the direct openness to reality that characterize mind and world seems jeopardized um, at this new interface, or if it's not, I'm not clear why now. So just have, I've, that's one of the main questions I wanted to raise, and I'll just want to look briefly at how Seller's original treatment of these matters um, we're in a certain interesting close parallel with McDowell's new view, but having a different basis that I think bears on what I take to be this problem that I'm at least getting from the initial reading of McDowell's view. So section four. The propositional aspect of perception is prominent in Sellers, and this is what the left-wing Salarzians, Rorty, Brandom, and McDowell have been primarily concerned to highlight, although now McDowell is, is highlighting other, uh, other aspects as well. McDowell frequently appeals to Seller's remarks in Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind on, quote, experiences as, so to speak, containing claims, unquote, which in the end is a picture of perceptions as a certain kind of thought that is, uh, McDowell might not use this language, but reliably evoked by objects. As a result of coming to be a competent speaker of English, I'm speaking more with Sellers than McDowell here, if Smith sincerely and unreflectively responds to the passing scene with the unstudied remark, there's a red apple on the table, then other things on the table, we can rely on Smith's observation to be a reliable indicator that, in all probability, there's a red apple on the table. And that's the source of Sellers' combined sort of externalist reliability cum internal reason justification view which he developed. Sosa remarks that it was remarkable, it was a neat trick for Sellers to develop, develop this externalism combined with internalism view in, in the 1950s since externalism wasn't even, reliableism wasn't really on the map. And then Sosa goes on to criticize this view that, that, that Sellers thinks you have to know, you have to be able to know that you're a reliable perceiver in order to have knowledge. And Sellers think, uh, Sosa thinks that's too steep a requirement for, for knowledge and that's an interesting debate. The conceptual contents in the perceptual thought, there's a red apple on the table, are determined on Sellers' view by a certain conceptual role semantics involving what Sellers called language entry, inference, and exit rules. What's attractive about this, this functionalist view, as, as Sellers also calls it, is that such a non-inferential perceptual response, there's a red apple on the table, which, so to speak, contains a claim, reliably evoked in the perceiver by the object, is by its very nature, by in virtue of its constituent conceptual contents, also a normative standing in the logical space of reasons. This is something I really like about Sellers' view. You just get evoked in you by the object. There's a red apple on the table. It's caused by the object, but it's a res it's a conceptual response, and the concept the contents of the cons of the concepts are determined by the inferential role of of the. the Brandom has a, has a similar view. And what's nice is Sellers does this for rational agency, too. He has a causal theory of intentions. Intentions are where you have uh, an I shall do A thought, which is reliably causative of, of the corresponding doing of A. And you grow up learning that you don't say, I'll answer the phone and then just sit there. You, you, don't, you don't get the concept of volition unless you generally follow up you, your I shall do A thoughts with the doing of A. No, it's exactly right. So that and uh, well, we, and Sellers has an article on weakness of will. Okay. Now, in their different ways, Rorty, Brandom, and McDowell, who's uh, Brand, um, all make productive neo-Hegelian use, is the way they sometimes characterize it, uh, 
of this holistic normative basis for Seller's rejection of the myth of the epistemic given. So the reason there's no given is because in perception, perception, so to speak, involve claims, because they're, they're, as it were, sentential responses to objects, and so you're already in the space of reasons. But Seller's treatment, how am I doing uh, on time? Okay. I don't have much left. Um, Seller's treatment of the sensory component of perceptual experience is certainly in, in Rorty and Brandom mainly reduced to its role as a necessary causal mediating link to the object. So that you have a reliable, you reliably respond to apples with there is an apple and sensations are part of the scientific story of how that reliable link is, is, is in place, but, but that's about it. And Rorty's very explicit that Sellers taught us, he says, that perception is just responding to an object with a belief or a sentence. That's how Rorty takes um, Sellers' view to be. And that, that sort of view, I, I think it's, I'm, I've been listening to Brandom's lectures on Sellers on the, on the web podcasts, and Brandom remarks that McDowell, his colleague, calls Brandom's view of observations, which are just sent responses evoked by the object, calls them not observations, but observations. And uh, McDowell thinks he has a more rich experiential content. And then I think there's something to what McDowell said. So McDowell's mainly critical treatments of sellers on sensations, on the other hand, have progressively improved from mind and world through to his more recent views. And at this stage, I just want to jump right in to conclude to Sellers' account of the proper and common sensibles, which anticipated aspects of McDowell's new account, as McDowell's aware, I think, but on importantly different grounds. In one important sense, as Brandom has stressed in particular, Seller's rejection of the myth of the given entails for him that any non-inferentially reliable response to an object counts as an observation of the object. And this might relate to some of the things Ode was discussing. So that trained scientists can straightforwardly be said to observe electrons just by looking at non-inferential responses to clown chambers. And Brandom always says that's, um, that is Seller's view of observation, of perception. It's just responding in that in reliable, non-inferential way with a concept. Less well known, however, although I'm sure Brandon is aware of it, is that Sellers also distinguished a pro as a proper part within that wider framework, and interestingly, precisely in his defense of scientific realism against Van Frassen, in one place he does this, between what he calls uh, an absolute conception of the observation framework. So as most scientific realists tend to de-emphasize the observation framework, Sellers actually defended it what he calls an absolute conception of the observation framework, then shows that that is unstable and scientific realism corrects the inadequacies in that framework, which is why Van Frassen, he thinks, is wrong. Um, but guess what the observation framework in, in, in the absolute sense? It's the proper and common sensibles of, of objects. So Sellers calls this perception proper in an article, is scientific realism tenable? The general idea here I is that while recognizing, as against the myth of the given, that all perceptual cognition involves conceptualization, Sellers agrees with that. Um, for example, cognitive seeing is typically seeing something as some kind of thing or other, and the, and the as involves a concept for Sellers, unless you're, an an except for what he calls animal representational systems, which are proto-propositional seeing as he thinks that's perfectly fine. Um, Sellers argues that we must also recognize a phenomenological sense in, what we, that in which what we see of a given object at any given time is roughly speaking its shaped and colored facing side, our old friends the proper and common sensibles. So to use one of his more famous examples, when we perceive some object to, to be a pink ice cube, what we see of the object is a certain cubical volume of pink. That's what we visually take in from the object. We do not see of the pink ice cube, for instance, those causal powers and dispositions that make it a cube of pink ice. And he thinks the tradition is right in saying you have sense impressions or sensations, visual sensations, of the pink and cube, but not of the ice. And the Kant's right about that, which is why causality is a concept that you apply to experiences, not sucked in from um, experiences of touching or pushing or anything like that. In this, um, Sellers, uh, sorry, I just read that, okay. So far, this fits well with McDowell's later view, and here's my final. So McDowell, I think, takes a lot of that from Sellers in his new view of sensory intuitions. 
In line with this, um, Sellers also developed the account, which McDowell exploits, of Kantian singular intuitions as minimal conceptual thinkings, to be understood the mod on the model of such demonstrative thoughts as this pink cube, which are non-propositional, yet consensually, conceptually contentful intuitings. So Sellers, like McDowell, finds this notion of intuition to be Kant's primary notion of intuition. Um, a kind of conceptualized singular representation of an object. But now is where Sellers dis disagrees with, with McDowell because he also thinks there's non-conceptual sensory representational content. Um, such conceptualized intuitions are fit to serve as the subject terms of perceptual judgments for Sellers. So in these respects, McDowell's new account of intuition shares many of the features of Sellers' original account of perception proper and of Kantian intuitions as a wider, uh, a subset of the wider notion of observation, if you want to call it that. Uh, I can say that because Brandon himself said it, said it, so I'm not. But Seller's view of the nature of these minimal conceptual intuitions is, of course, different from McDowell's in two crucial respects, to end with this. Firstly, while we've just seen that from McDowell, such intuitions are not themselves perceptual recognitions or takings to be, for sellers, sellers, such subject terms are perceptual takings as, or takings to be something or other. They're not propositional, but they're a conceptual taking something to be some way, or a seeing as some way. Where the concept in the, the this cube or this such intuition specifies the con kind of empirical object that something is taking, that something is taken to be. And the same holds for perceptual takings such as this cardinal or this cube of ice. As the same holds for those as for the sensible intuition, this cube of pink, the proper sensibles. Sellers thus does not sharply distinguish in that way, by saying certain ones aren't takings and certain ones are, between conceptually intuiting and perceptually recognizing. He doesn't have that, that new gap in, in McDowell, if it is a gap. I'm sure McDowell would say it isn't a gap. Um, which I find problematic in, on, on, in McDowell's new view. So I take this to be one, a virtue of Seller's account, first of all, that the this such intuitions that are singular conceptual responses to objects are always takings to be, where the what you're taking a thing to be is given by the concept in the this such response, and that it avoids that new distinction, which, which I find awkward, um, in, in, at least initially, in, in McDowell's view. But if conceptualized intuitions on Seller's account are themselves perceptual takings or recognitions, and in that sense do not discriminate against cardinals in favor of red aviform-shaped objects, what's the basis for Seller's phenomenological isolation of the perceptual of perception proper uh, in the intuition of the proper and common sensibles that we see of the objects we see? So we see of the object it's facing shaped, colored, size. Well, if he's not going to make this distinction between intuitings versus takings, what's he do? Um, they're all takings, but this is precisely the second and most obvious difference between Sellers and McDowell's account of Kantian intuitions. The reason that the proper and common sensibles presented in experience are what we saw McDowell call, really in passing, a natural stopping point for characterizing experience per se is as Sellers sees it because such sensible qualities are non-conceptually represented in the experience and can be represented that way for other animals in a sense, at least I'll qualify this in, a, in just a second. So the stopping point for Sellers is natural in a strong and straightforward sense. We're naturally built visually for those sorts of qualities to be, to be basic. Whereas the cop causal properties that make ice such as to cool tea are conceptually represented or thought in the perception of a pink ice cube, and the conceptual contents pink and cube are also part of the experience, Sellers takes it to be what he calls, in the later Karras lectures, a basic phenomenological fact that the cubical volume of pink present in the experience is, quote, present in some way present to the perceiver other than as thought of, unquote. That is, it's non-conceptually present. You, do, you don't have a false belief that there's that you're hallucinating a, a pink ice cube. Um, obviously, Sellers would, McDowell's going to handle this with his disjunctive account of non-veridical hallucinations and so on. And, and Sellers doesn't have that worthy opponent view, which is very influential now in his sights. 
But what Sellers thinks is it's clear that if you vividly hallucinate a pink ice cube or a pink element, elephant, there's actual pinkness represented in the experience. Not, not just thought of represented in the experience, but it, in some way there's pink somewhere in the universe if you're vividly hallucinating a pink ice cube. McDowell and Dennett, and uh, McDowell in his way denies that. That's the bad disjunct. There is no uh, pinkness in the hallucinated um, content. There's, there's some more I'd like to say, and uh, there are the final quotes from Sellers, but um, there's a lot that then you can make of what do we make of this non-conceptual content. Paul spells out in his book a critical realist view that's built on accommodating that non-conceptual content. There are interesting issues about what makes it content, what makes just the occurrence of this. And um, I think Sellers has two kinds of answers to that. One is there's an isomorphism that results from these regularities such that, and here's the quote, um, quote 18, final quote, for even in normal cases, says Sellers, there's the gen genuine question, quote, why does the perceiver conceptually represent a red as opposed to a blue, rectangular as opposed to circular object in the presence of an object having these qualities? The answer would seem to require that all the possible ways, here comes the isomorphism, in which conceptual representations of color and shape can resemble and differ correspond to ways in which their immediate non-conceptual occasions which must surely be construed as states that the perceiver can resemble and differ. Well, McDowell's going to reject the surely, and this is just a live debate on which I'm not taking a stand. But what I, what I do want to, so one sense in which the non-conceptual sensing is content is that there's a story to be told about how it, and it, the relationships among the qualities of the objects are isomorphic to relationships obtaining among the sense impressions. Now, I think isomorphisms are cheap, but what also is part of Seller's view is the non-conceptual representation wouldn't be of this thing unless it were caught up in the in case of human experience, the game of giving and asking for reasons. That is, the reason my sensing a red um, square next to a, a blue triangle is of these relevant objects is that it's a response to those objects that's also responded to conceptually. And so that you can, you can you, a scientist can stimulate your cortex so that you have the sensation of a blue cube next to a red circle. Um, and that would, in a sense, um, not be firing correctly because there are dependencies and, and patterns of this is a familiar sort of view that we're trained to respond to um, the presence of these sorts of objects with these sorts of perceptual responses. Um, but even more basically, I think he argues when what he calls animal representational systems that they're proto-propositionally contentful in that animals are designed to form certain kinds of sensory representations in the presence of certain kinds of objects like the, fl well, like the flog frog that uh, uh, has the tongue lashing mechanism in response to the, to the fly. So I think he's got some things to say about what non-conceptual representation is. He says it's intentional with an S but not with a T because there's a way that um, it, can, it can falsely fire and so on. Um, I could go on, but I think I'll just stop at that point. Thanks. Okay. Paul, do you want to start off and keep your hands up? How long did I go for?